Occidental College in California is considering instituting a system for students to report so-called microaggressions perpetrated against them on campus. Microaggressions are statements that intentionally- Hey, Internets. When skimming through various political and social hot-button issues, you may have come across the following statement. I feel oppressed, therefore, I am oppressed. Which then begs the question, just how deep does the rabbit hole of fraudulent victimhood go? The answer, as this video will show you, is, unfortunately, a lot deeper than you might think. A person who has been victimized is someone who has had something done to them unjustly, generally without their consent. Justice in this case is to simply undo that which has been done without that consent. For example, say someone commits the crime of stealing your smartphone. Basic justice for you would be that the thief, once caught, should have to return that smartphone to you. Most people would would also agree that the thief should also pay something additional for the trouble they caused, such as paying a fine to compensate everyone involved for the inconvenience, and also to disincentivize theft in the community. This dynamic forms the core basis for law that exists in just about every functioning society. However, there is a small issue. Sometimes people claim to be a victim of a crime that did not actually occur. On a surface level, most people by the time they have reached adulthood understand that not everyone who claims to be a victim is actually a victim. Most people anyway. This happens because the status of being a victim necessarily confers upon them a level of power over the alleged perpetrator, which unfortunately means that either a cowardly individual can attempt to indirectly attack someone by falsely claiming victim status, or a delusional individual can throw a wrench in the concept of justice by believing themselves to be a victim of something that is completely a figment of their imagination. Whenever something grants power, there will unfortunately be an incentive for dishonest or desperate people to seek it for reasons that go against the purpose of that power. Sometimes fake victimhood can take the form of petty revenge after a breakup or failed romantic relationship, where one person falsely accuses the other of some form of abuse. And other times it can take the form of cry bullying, where instead of directly bullying someone, a bully will falsely accuse their target of being the harasser as a way to harass them by getting sympathizers on their side to gang up on their target using lies and manipulation purely for sadistic pleasure and the feeling of power the cry bully gets from manipulating others. Another example would be grievance scripters, people who claim to find something offensive when they in fact do not actually really find it offensive at all. They're just pretending to for the purpose of either clout or just dogpiling or another form of crybullying. And then there's also the case of people claiming that they should be given trillions of dollars for reparations based on exaggerations and misguided notions of collective guilt and collective victimhood, often from crimes that allegedly happened centuries ago and may or may not still have any kind of impact today. And of course, there are those who just flat out suffer from persecutory delusions and the victimhood mentality, those who make being a victim a central component of their personality. And lastly, there are people who perceive themselves as victims purely because they have been told that they are victims, and thus they interpret anything bad that happens to them as a component of oppression that they have been told to see. Normally, all of these examples of fraudulent victimhood would have straightforward solutions to prevent the justice system from being perverted by all of the clownery. But there is one very very big problem that stands in the way of that, which is that the subject of fraudulent or mistaken victim status is often horribly misunderstood by some of the people who are supposed to be experts in the fields of psychology and social science, leading to grave mistakes being made in how we interpret polling data, how findings are reported to the masses, and how related research is often conducted with a major error baked to their methodology. This error that I am referring to is what I like to call the victim perception fallacy which is the tendency to drastically overestimate the reliability of self-reported perceptions in regards to persecution and oppression, resulting in unreasonably high levels of trust being granted to those claiming victim status. And the reason why this fallacy is such a huge problem is actually pretty straightforward. These self-reported perceptions of persecution and oppression, victimhood and whatnot are actually extremely unreliable. The average person's ability to tell whether their failings are the result of their own poor choices in life, or if they are the result of some kind of invisible systemic oppression that is victimizing them, is very, very low. To the point of, well, near zero. So how do we know this? Well, let's take a look at a few studies that show just how bad people's perceptions of this is. With the first of these just being understanding what a victim mentality is, in regards to psychology. At the core of victimhood is the phrase, this is not my fault. And this is a very attractive thing for the average person to believe in, to the point where we actually expect each other to shift blame because of how common this happens. For instance, a study on the effect of admitting fault versus shifting the blame on expectations for others to do the same found that contrary
contrary to their expectations, people were expecting greater blame shifting after exposure to a responsible agent. Or in simpler terms, when we know that someone's at fault, we just expect them to try and dodge blame. Because this is just unfortunately how human beings are. This means that the victim mentality can arise in anybody who is being avoidant to responsibility. And people who tell themselves that they are always being oppressed and always persecuted by some invisible force can avoid ever taking on any said responsibilities at all. In other words, the lazy are incentivized to use fraudulent victim status as an excuse to, well, never really grow up. This problem is made even worse with people who suffer from certain personality disorders. For example, exaggerations of victimhood is highly associated with narcissistic personality disorder. This happens because narcissists consider themselves superior beyond what they actually are, which means that the world never treats them with the respect they believe that they deserve, as their experience does not match the sense of entitlement and self-importance that they have. So the narcissist will conclude that people are being rude to them or mistreating them, when of course in reality they are just being treated the same as anybody else, and often with exactly the exact amount of respect that they deserve. And thus their feelings of victimhood are entirely a figment of their imagination as a result of their incorrect perception of inflated self-worth. Or to put it simply, people with planet-sized egos think they are being oppressed because others won't roll out the red carpet for them. And unfortunately, narcissism is not equally represented within all groups of people by sex, gender, age, ethnicity, nationality, or pretty much any other possible way you want to slice it. This makes the whole thing somewhat complicated to control for when talking about alleged group systemic oppression. Now, people who are not convinced yet that the victim perception fallacy is a serious problem might bring up the fact, well, hey, wait a minute, those are just people who are deliberately trying to avoid responsibility so that they don't get punished for their bad behavior, and narcissists are just people who suffer from a personality disorder and are not good representation of humanity on average. Well, as it turns out, there have also been studies on average people and how they perceive oppression. And uh, spoiler alert, we didn't do so hot. One study that particularly stands out is perceptions of the impact of negatively valued physical characteristics on social interaction. Now, what these absolute mad lads did was they took people and placed them in a social interaction and then led them to believe that they were being seen as superficially inferior in the eyes of a person that they were interacting with, in some form or another. For example, they were led to believe that the other person thought that they had allergies or epilepsy or some other negatively valued trait for the time that this study was conducted in. Now, the kicker here, of course, was that the person they were interacting with, in fact, did not actually believe this, and was treating the participants the same regardless. And yet, the people in the study who were misled perceived that they were being mistreated or otherwise treated differently by said person, even though they were not. So this perception of oppression or mistreatment only existed in their minds. And this has some really interesting implications, because it means that someone's belief that they are a victim of invisible oppression does not necessarily need to depend on any real evidence. If we are led to believe the oppression exists somehow, or the negative stereotype against us somehow exists, we will find evidence for it regardless of reality. This flips a lot of the power dynamics we see in everyday social interactions way on its head. If a person expects to be mistreated in public, they will often perceive that mistreatment as happening even if it is not actually happening. Which brings up a very interesting question for people who are always claiming to be oppressed, especially those who've been told to think this way because they arbitrarily belong to some kind of subjective group. Are they really experiencing this invisible oppression, or are they simply seeing what they have been told to see? Now, the reason this confusion happens is actually pretty simple to understand, and it all comes down to a really basic flaw in how human perception works. People, as it turns out, are not mind readers. At the end of the day, we can only make guesses as to why others treat us the way that they did. The reasons are completely subjective, and for the most part invisible to us, because again, we can't read their minds, we can only guess. And so what people do is they make those guesses based on their various presuppositions, at least in regards to how they think others are perceiving them. In other words, this proves to us that perceptions of victimhood are to some degree rooted in psychological projection. A person who believes that they are a victim, for whatever reason, will project that belief onto others and then read that into any behavior which is directed towards them. Whether or not any prejudice of any sort actually exists or not is irrelevant to their perception. And the cherry on top of all of this, interestingly enough, is that cathedralites have no problem accepting the fact that this is true, but only when talking about groups of people that they do not like as there have been a number of partisan studies on how the other party is so easily convinced that they are a victim when their victimhood totally doesn't exist, but our victimhood is totally real. 
Anyways, the point that is proven here is the main problem with the victim perception fallacy. Perceptions that one is the victim of mass prejudice and oppression are completely independent of any verifiable state of oppression. This means people's self-reported data in regards to whether they face discrimination or not should rightfully be seen as the lowest possible form of evidence for said prejudice and discrimination, if it is to be seen as evidence at all. But of course, none of this is really that big of a deal. Because, of course, all the experts trademark, working for the corporate media and so-called academics working on their next prestige-seeking virtue signal disguised as academic research, would surely never make such a colossal blunder as to take self-reported perceptions of oppression at face value and hold on to them as the primary evidence of what they are reporting, right? I mean, that's just such an obvious mistake, so of course they wouldn't do that. They're totally doing that. And the weirdest thing about this is that what I have said so far in regards to psychology doesn't actually go against the academic consensus. There are many other studies which show that people are bad at mind reading when it comes to alleging some form of discrimination. If someone has these presuppositions or otherwise preconceived notions that they are the target of some kind of mass social prejudice, they will read that prejudice into all of their everyday interactions and will see it everywhere regardless of whether it exists or not. This is a well-known psychological problem with how humans think, and yet it is often ignored whenever people want to push an oppression narrative. Which means it's now time to move on to showing the victim perception fallacy in action. Starting with the most obvious example of this stupidity, microaggression studies. So microaggressions are a term coined by a Harvard professor about 50 years ago, Chester M. Pierce, I believe. It was originally used to describe a phenomenon between whites and blacks, but eventually evolved beyond ethnicity to include just about every identity group you can think of. No, really, if you don't have enough grievances to grift off, you can just invent a new identity group these days if you want. Yeah, welcome to 2023. Anyways, microaggressions represent the idea that small, often unintended interactions can cause unintended offenses and hurt feelings through casual disparagement. Sound confusing? Well, here are some examples of known microaggressions to clear things up for you. Interrupting a protected class member. Complimenting a foreigner on their ability to speak English. Asking where someone is from in casual conversation. Believing in meritocracy. Not being colorblind and acknowledging that someone might be a minority or might be a foreigner. Alternatively, being colorblind can also be a microaggression by failing to acknowledge that someone is a minority. Yeah, sorry, depending on which individual you are talking to, one or the other counts as a microaggression. Better work on those mind reading skills, mate. You wouldn't want to accidentally offend someone now, so better work on those psychic powers. Get to work. Uh, all kidding aside, if this all sounds pretty subjective to you in that anything and everything can be considered one and it's all pretty indistinguishable from the same day-to-day -day crap that everyone deals with, well, you would be correct. And as you can probably guess from the subject of this video so far, a lot of the studies that claim to prove the existence of microaggressions do indeed heavily rely on the victim perception fallacy as their main source of evidence. One particular paper, a revised racial microaggressions taxonomy, did a review of several microaggression studies. All the ones I looked at either A provided absolutely no objective evidence whatsoever and simply expects the reader to take what they are saying at face value, or B they commit the equity fallacy instead, or C, you guessed it, relied entirely on self-reported perceptions through ma lived experiences of these microaggressions. With the most common methodology being taking extremely small sample sizes, interviewing them about their victimization perceptions, and then presenting their findings as the primary evidence for their totally authentic papers, and totally not ideologically driven masturbatory virtue signals disguised as honest research. They feel oppressed, they report oppression, therefore they are oppressed. Don't ask questions. Blind test to make sure these people aren't just projecting their insecurities into the world? Nah, we don't need to do that. Now, beyond microaggressions, more examples of the victim perception fallacy can be found in just general identity politics and the grievance industry as a whole. But before I go into these, I need to point out an inherent problem of circularity that is present in how our society addresses victimhood. Mainstream media will report to the masses that Group A is being oppressed. Group A will then interpret things that are happening to them through the lens of victimhood, since the media told them, and thus some of them will start to see this oppression around them, regardless of whether or not it exists. Researchers then collect these self reported perceptions of victimhood from group A and then report them to the media. Do you see the problem here? By taking these perceptions at face value and assuming them to be completely valid, rather than understanding that it is low-level evidence at absolute best, a single exaggeration could potentially lock a society in a circular trap where they will see oppression everywhere around them regardless of whether or not it exists. As long as the victim perception fallacy is taken as primary evidence, this circle has no way to break. 
because people in Group A will just see this report and interpret everything bad that happens to them as a result of the persecution that they've been told to see. So there will always be some self-reported data that is greater than zero so long as this identity politics game is being played. The most obvious example of this happening can probably be seen in the pervasive myth of the gender wage gap. I already went into heavy detail on this gap in a previous video, TLDR, the gap vanishes when you account for the differences in male and female incentive structures in regards to how male and female choices and values differentiate when they wish to start a family. In fact, women actually earn more when all of it is controlled for. So how does the myth persist? Simple, the victim perception fallacy. Women are overwhelmingly propagandized into seeing this oppression in the workplace, so of course they do, they see it, as this makes them more likely to blame things like not getting a promotion on their gender than a male might. Polling data is then taken, such as in Pew Research data, which of course shows women believing this oppression exists because they've been told to see it, and then the research is reported to us through the media, reinforcing the feelings of oppression, guaranteeing that the oppression will be seen in the future, regardless of whether or not it actually exists. Similar grifts can be found in other forms of divide and conquer id poll. These self-reported anecdotes are often used as primary evidence for the Hispanic discrimination as well, of course. Same thing with the LGBT community, as well as the Asian community. Which, in regards to the Asian community, specific attention should be given to CNN's anti-white blend of Asian identity politics, relying on, again, mostly self-reported perceptions. In regards to this, there was a particularly well-made thread on the Twitter from True Discipline that breaks down how just about everything about this narrative is based on demonstrable lies. I recommend giving it a read if you're interested in going down yet another rabbit hole, which shows once again how demagogues in the mainstream media are perfectly willing to take data out of context to push false narratives. There's also a fairly good article from the commentary by Wilford Riley, which showed how the actual crime statistics did not match CNN's narrative. Suggesting that the entire thing from CNN was really just a grift, it was nothing more than a race-baiting identity politics ploy to pit whites and Asians against each other while pretending that they were doing it to defend Asians, which they weren't. They didn't actually care. If they did, they would have gotten the data right. But by far, the biggest example of the victim perception fallacy being used by the grievance industry is probably the propaganda which targets the black community. This is so prevalent that I've actually decided I'm not going to cite any specific examples. And why am I not going to cite any specific examples? Simple, because I would rather people look this one up on their own and discover the victim perception fallacy in action for yourself. Don't worry, it's pretty easy to do. A simple Google search on black reported feelings of prejudice and discrimination and whatnot will return an endless amount of results for you. You also may notice just how frequent it is that the equity fallacy is played hand in hand with the victim perception fallacy where disparate outcomes are presented as proof of discrimination, which they are not, alongside the anecdotal perceptions of victimhood. But then you might ask yourself, well, why does it matter? The answer to that can be found when you look at the consequences of the victimhood mentality. There's a saying out there that men never do evil so completely and cheerfully as when they do it from religious conviction. Well, as it turns out, you can probably replace religion in this statement with victimhood, and it would actually be more accurate. The first problem is that people who fall for the victimhood mindset gain a sense of entitlement and often partake in selfish behavior. This was pretty well documented in the aptly named study, Victim Entitlement to Behave Selfishly. They did a few different experiments to confirm this, but I found the last one, Experiment 3, on claiming a bigger piece of the pie to be the more interesting one. In this experiment, they had people play a computer game which was rigged up so that they would lose. However, it was rigged differently for a control group. They had some people lose in a way that they were led to believe that they lost as a result of their own poor performance performance in the game, but then they had other people lose the game in a way that looked like they lost because of a computer glitch. In both cases, they were led to believe that they lost out on some kind of monetary prize. The participants were then asked how they would allocate money in a future game under the hypothetical scenario that they won. The people who were led to believe they had lost the first game as a result of a glitch were much more likely to give the selfish response. Now, why does this matter? Well, because of the implication it has in psychology and social interactions. Say someone believes that they are a victim, and they act selfishly in public because they believe that they're a victim, and so they get treated like crap from people because they're acting selfishly. Victim status confirmed! You see, not only does narcissism lead to victimhood, but the reverse is also true. People who are injected with victimhood can also take on narcissistic personality traits. Which just adds another negative feedback loop, on top of the already existing negative feedback loop, of the media reporting that Group A is being repressed, and then Group A thinking that they're oppressed, and then Group A reporting that they're oppressed. But in layman's terms, having a victimhood mentality can turn a person into a jerk. They'll be meaner, they'll be less agreeable, they'll be more selfish, etc, etc. And when people have a victim mentality for a prolonged period of time, this eventually just starts to become a part of their personality. 
The next problem is that victimhood makes people easily manipulated, which is why powerful elites love to push it so much and why they don't really mind using studies that are using questionable forms of data to prove it. The core of victimhood, that it's not my fault, also quite heavily implies that it's somebody else's fault. This creates an opening for an authoritarian demagogue to come in and divide people into groups of oppressors and oppressed as a way of gaining support. This can easily lead to justifications for genocide, which is ironic in a twisted sort of way that fake victimhood can actually lead to real victimhood. Under the hood of nearly every genocide, you will find an us versus them mentality, often justified with a victim narrative beating the drums. If a person in a position of authority, especially a position which controls the intellectual institutions and the media, decides they want to get rid of a certain group of people, it is a lot easier than you might think for them to generate false evidence that said group of people is victimizing everyone else. With this victim perception fallacy, along with the circularity it tends to create, being an easy go-to way to pull said evidence out of basically thin air. I also want to say that people who keep up with my posts about potential future content I plan to make may be aware that I am working on a video that is about refuting tankies on their denial of the Holodomor in extreme detail. Let's just say there's a reason I decided to release this video that you are watching right now for. Although it is important to point out that it's not always genocide as the goal. Sometimes it's a little bit more simple than that, and a little bit less evil than that. Sometimes elites are just trying to deflect blame off of themselves. For example, the false harassment and victimhood narrative that came with Gamergate. To make a long story short, it was just journalists trying to deflect from their misbehavior by casting everybody who called out that misbehavior into the misogyny's box. Which, by the way, that long-awaited airplay video is out, in case anybody was wondering. It's a bit long and starts out a little disconnected, but by the end everything is tied together quite nicely. Anyways, the last consequence is more of just an individual one. Victimhood does not help you. Unless you are aiming to be a professional victim grifter and make an actual career out of being a victim, taking on a victim mentality will generally make you less successful in nearly all measures of life. And the reason this happens is pretty darn simple, really. When people do not have a victim mentality, it means they look at themselves first when experiencing failure and think about how they can improve and move on and do better next time. This is why a huge red pill is realizing that the strategy of self-blame and reflection is actually extremely empowering, because it means that your go-to response to problems is look for how you can personally find a solution to that problem and what you can do to improve upon finding that solution. However, with the victim mentality, this is absolutely not the case. The serial victim will simply blame the world around them, and then seethe, cope, and mauled instead of looking for a solution to their problems. Or worse yet, look to a victim-grifting political demagogue who promises to use big government to solve all their problems for them. Such as the lovely fixed pie fallacy. Yeah man, the reason you have less is because other people have more, therefore you need to vote for more taxes and bigger government. Brilliant solution. So what's the conclusion here? Well, the main thing I want to first point out is that I am not saying that prejudice based on visible traits doesn't exist in human society. Of course it does. Tribalism is very obviously a thing. However, the solution to said tribalism will almost certainly not be found in its amplification. Anyone who tries to sell you that is either a massive grifter or a fool or possibly both. The main point here that I am making is that the prevalence of this prejudice is very likely being overstated due to the over-reliance on anecdotal evidence based on subjective experiences of said prejudice, aka this victim perception fallacy, as people are not actually capable of knowing whether they are being mistreated based on their identity group or not, and can be easily led to see mistreatment where it is not actually present. The harsh reality is that much of the grievance industry and the political victimhood demagoguery we see in current year is being largely fueled by bad research which is then propagated through propaganda mills. And all I'm really doing here is calling that propaganda out. Nothing more, nothing less. So thanks for watching. If you enjoyed the video, feel free to like, share, subscribe, or leave me a tip on Ko-Fi if you really enjoyed the video. You can also follow me on X or Twitter, or even join the Discord. Till next time.